when you think about it, uh, life is a series of moments where you have these expectations about what something will be and then reality comes crashing into it, right? There's so much of life that lives in that gap between our expectations and reality. A lot of times this happens with food and the way that food is advertised. Uh, so like say, for example, uh, you're at a restaurant and you see this on the menu, it's a steak salad. And all the men are like, yeah, I can have steak and feel a little bit better about myself with a salad, right? Uh, steak salad, but then you get it at your table and it looks like this. <laughs> Not quite as advertised. Or maybe today you wanted to get some brunch after this service. You head to uh, an establishment in town where they have French toast. And you're like, oh, man, that looks decadent. Oh, we'll just split it. We'll just split it over brunch. And you're so excited about that. But you get it to your table and it looks like this. Let's, let's move on quickly uh, from this little too gross here this morning. Uh, anyway, uh, so say that you're, you know, it's football season and you're wanting to buy a new TV, right? You want to buy a new TV. Uh, it's the perfect excuse, guys, to try to be like, hey, we, we need to get a new TV, a new 8K TV, Samsung, something that looks great. You look online and you see, oh, there's some deals on some Samsung TVs on Timu.com. But when you receive the TV, it looks like this. Smash snug. I'm sure the picture is as crystal clear on a smash snug, right? Never buying another TV off of Timu. Here's your, if you get nothing else from today, be mindful of what you buy off of Timu and Shein or whatever.com, right? Anyway, uh, this can be true of our spiritual journey as well, can it? <laughs> like when we uh, sign up, say yes to a life in rhythm with God and the way that God is leading us in our lives, um, we get in that game and then reality comes crashing in, doesn't it? Often, it's not ever what we want it to be when we sign up. And there is a gap of our expectations in reality. I'll put it this way in this graphic. There's an expectation of a life with God, what it's gonna look like, what it's gonna feel like, what's gonna happen in my life because I'm walking in rhythm with God. And then there's an actual lived experience that's never what we feel like it's gonna be or think it's gonna be at the beginning. And let me just say on the front end, if, if no one's ever vocalized this to you in church, oh, that is a tragedy. <laughs> because reality is that a life with God is not an up and to the right thing. It's still a roller coaster. It's still got lots of peaks and valleys, but it just means that we're not alone in it. Have you ever had this experience uh, on your journey with God, if you've been walking with God for a long time, where you have these expectations of God, to where like, oh man, I, I just get to church and I just hear the singing. I can't even sing because I'm crying because it's so powerful. I've got to have these lifelong friendships with these people in church. And then you realize they're, they're messed up people like you and they hurt you just like other people hurt you. You have these expectations of a life with God to where you can just open up scripture and it's like God is speaking directly to you. and You can't wait to open up the Bible and have that time, expectations. And then real life hits you and you get distracted by lots of things to where you're like, oh, I could do anything but read my Bible right now. And you open up the pages of scripture and you're like, yeah, that means nothing to me right now. Uh, I'll just go back to Psalms or I'll go back to the book of John, right? And, or you just close it all together. Maybe it's in prayer where you have expectations of a life with God where you're pouring out your heart to God, praying for him to do something and you receive radio silence on the other end. Or you get an answer, but man, it was not what you were praying for. That was your actual lived experience. We all, on the spiritual journey, uh, I, I feel like I'm telling you guys some of this for the first time. It's like the first time I'm like, you're having this vocalized to you by a pastor. But this is what it is. We all have this journey where there's a gap between our expectations and our actual lived experiences with God. And I think a lot of times in the West, in our evangelical church system, we set people up to not understand this reality, and it leads to a lot of hurt and a lot of faith crises. I remember when I was in high school, um, every summer I was pumped to go to church camp. Uh, church camp was like this holy place where God was more real than anywhere else, any other time of the year, these seven days, this was everything. I was a part of a church that uh, we took a charter bus down to Florida for church camp. And it's like you were doing your quiet time devotional, reading scripture and praying, like looking out at the Gulf. And it's like beautiful. And you're in these sessions where the band was incredible. The music was perfect and everybody just singing so loud. The communicating and the preaching was so clear and so direct to your life. You just felt like, uh, when I come home, man, I'm on fire and I'm just going to change the world. And this is like my new rhythm of life because of how real and how present God was to me at church camp. 
and it's like a church camp high. <laughs> and I came home, and I got distracted by things. I had friends that were not walking in that direction, and they walked in a different direction, and I loved them, so sometimes I'd walk with them, and I wouldn't open up the scriptures as much because it just didn't feel like it was working as well as it was when I was staring out at the ocean. <laughs> and the songs, oh, they're not singing the song on Sunday that I liked at church camp, so there was this consumeristic thing that came into me, and it was like, I don't know, it's just not as good. There's a gap between my expectations with a life with God and actual lived experiences. And what happens often, and we don't talk about this, is that we have a faith crisis where we think, oh man, maybe this was not real. Maybe God is not there. Maybe God is not for me the way that I thought he was for me. Maybe it was just all endorphins and decimal, decibels of loud music. Maybe that's all that this whole thing was. We find ourselves maybe starting to slow ghost the church experience or start to slow ghost Jesus and just sort of walk away from him. And the reality is, oftentimes, we don't think about this reality because there are certain verses that we've held on to as personal promises to us that just don't play out in the actual lived experience. And one of them is the verse we're going to close our series misunderstood with today, or as we probably should have called the series, Joel ruins your favorite Bible verses. Um, it's Jeremiah 29.11. So what Jeremiah 29.11 says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. What is not to love about this verse, right? Name it and claim it. This is awesome stuff, right? Like we're talking about a God who knows plans. He has plans for us. He like knows where I'm going before I do. And these plans are to prosper, prosperity. Ooh, that sounds nice. Comfort, not to harm us, but like positive things and comfort. Plans to give you hope beyond what you can see. Hope and a future, a good future when we are hazy about what our future looks like. Oh, that sounds so good, right? And we want to just claim that promise for ourselves every time we get, especially at weddings and graduation open houses. This is one of the most popular Bible verses right next to Philippians 4.13. Man, if you look up some like swag online, you can get Jeremiah 29.11 swag everywhere. Check this out. Water bottles. What quenched your thirst more than Jeremiah 29.11? Bracelets, t-shirts, an iPhone cover, a phone cover, like case? Come on. Like you can see that every time you turn it around, you see this promise that God specifically has for your life. It sounds really great. But there are some implications, some problems that arise when we take this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, and we name it and we claim it for ourselves over our individual lives like it's just this great big hug from God. One of those problems is, is that we, we hold God to a promise for our life that can we just be real like it just doesn't feel like that all the time or even often that God has got these plans for us and it's going to be all up and to the right it's all glorious, good, prosperity, and comfort. We hold God to that promise, and perhaps God never made that specific promise to you. We take a verse that might have been meant for another group of people, and we claim it for ourselves, over ourselves. And what we've already talked about tends to happen over and over again. When we claim that verse and it doesn't happen, our faith can get upended because the roots weren't very deep. They were just in our circumstances, and one thing that's true about our circumstances, right, is that they're always changing. And so we walk away, or we slow ghost church and God, and we think, maybe this is just not what I signed up for. And in this series, Misunderstood, if you've missed the last four weeks, we've been looking at some of these classic memory verses, like some of these classic Bible verses, and we've been looking at the story around them, the context around them, to ask better questions about them, because we tend to just treat the Bible as if it was written to us as God's direct love letter to us and there's nothing else going on. And we've looked at some of the pitfalls of doing that. We've asked better questions about how do we understand the context around these verses. And one of the guardrails that we've had whenever we're trying to understand the Bible is this right here. Is to understand that the Bible was written for us, not to us. Now there are principles and truths that are written for us, but it was not written to us. There's an ancient author and an ancient audience. And we need to first understand what was the intent for the author to the audience and then build principles to our lives after that, which we don't like doing in Western Christianity because it's too slow and it takes work and we like everything to be about me, myself, and I, right? <laughs> but the Bible, man, it was written for you, but it's not written to you. So we need to ask the questions, 
what's really going on in the context around these verses. We've been using this tool every week to understand the context of a verse. The text, the verse, the passage we're trying to understand is surrounded by the context around it, verses before and after, and what's going on in the world around it. So we've asked different questions like culturally, geographically, visually, what's going on around this verse? Today we're going to circle around the historical context. What's going on in the world at this time? The literary context. What kind of literature are we dealing with and what's happening before and after it in the flow of literary thought? And then one, I know somebody's been waiting for this, one linguistic piece. We're going to get, into, oh yeah, oh, that, was a, like a, that wasn't even a sarcastic. Somebody goes, yeah, yeah, linguistic. We're going to look at what a word actually means that we can miss sometimes. But we're going to ask this about Jeremiah 29, 11, because here's what I want. This is my pastor's heart for you. I want you to hold on to what the true promise is in Jeremiah 29, 11, and I don't want you to be upended in your faith being upended by a promise that wasn't meant to be there for you. So first, we're going to look at the historical context of what's going on at the time that Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, 11 was written. And the one word for the context of what's going on at this time is exile. It's not good news. It's not a wedding reception. It's not an open house and not a graduation. It's exile, a deportation from a stronger conquering nation to God's people of Israel. God's chosen people of Israel, they started with Abram or Abraham, who was told, come, come partner with me. God says, come partner with me. I want you to be a great nation and be a blessing to all of the world. And that nation was called Israel. And Israel, they struggled to trust this calling, and they lost the plot over and over again and started worshiping other gods and uh, going and doing things that they were never called to do in this covenantal relationship with God. And they just couldn't trust God, and so they lost the plot. And so after the hundreds and hundreds of years, God had to get their attention. He wanted to discipline them like a good parent does when we're trying to get our kids' attention. He goes, okay. I'm going to take some protection off of you. You're going to be exiled by the Assyrians in 722. The Assyrians come in, they conquer God's people as God's trying to wake them up to this reality of how they're missing the point and they've lost the plot. And they're conquered by the Assyrians. They have to leave their homes and go live in Assyria in this soft kind of slavery, not the way they were called to live. And then in 586 BC, there's another exile by the Babylonians led by King Nebuchadnezzar. If you're looking for a kid's name for a boy, Nebuchadnezzar's still on the table, I promise you. But this is the context in which Jeremiah is writing these words. It's exile. It's God's people are being punished. God just, God's hedge of protection has been lifted off them so that they would wake up and remember their calling. And it's bad news way before it's good news. Which gets us to the author of Jeremiah. Is, it's Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is what's called a prophet in the Old Testament. Now, when we hear prophet, what do we think? We think of telling the future, predicting the future, crystal ball, looking at what's going to happen in the future. And that is a tragedy when we talk about Old Testament prophets, because in the world of biblical prophecy, that's such a small slither of their reputation. The role of a biblical prophet was to be a mouthpiece for God, to give a heavenly perspective on a current reality with something to say about the future. But it's to give this big, wide perspective of what God's really seeing and what's really going on, the forest instead of the trees. That's what biblical prophets did. And so Jeremiah is called to be a mouthpiece of God, to speak to God's people, to tell them about this punishment that they're receiving, this discipline that they're receiving, that, hey, you just got back from an exile from the Assyrians, you're going back in because you guys still didn't learn your lesson, right? And so he comes and he's going to give them some of this prophetic voice to give them God's message to them. But we see in the literary context of Jeremiah that um, there's a lot of other people trying to speak for God. There's this conversation from chapters 25 to 29 of false prophets and true prophets. And there's one prophet that shows up in Jeremiah uh, 28, actually. His name is Hananiah. And Hananiah's prophecy, his word to God's people is this about the upcoming exile. This is what the Lord says. In the same way, I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, off of the neck of all the nations within two years. Hananiah says this, you know, it's bad, but it's going to be within two years. It's all over with. So hold on, guys. Learn your lesson. This is Hananiah coming in with some soft news. Within two years, it's all over with because God's going to rescue you and take down Nebuchadnezzar. Now, let's contrast this to Jeremiah's message that comes just a few chapters earlier. Earlier, This is what Jeremiah says. 
The whole country will become a desolate wasteland and the nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. I'm telling you, Jeremiah, every time he brought prophecy, every time he speaks in the Old Testament, it sounds like this. He is a sad trombone. Biblical scholars call him the weeping prophet. It's always the glass half empty for Jeremiah, right? Like he's like a sad guy, but he's been tasked to bring this hard reality that things are going to get worse way before they get better. Hananiah says two years, 70 years is what Jeremiah predicts. This is a hard message. This is a challenging message that Jeremiah, the sad trombone prophet, is bringing here when he says that it's going to get bad. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And in chapter 29, uh, Jeremiah is continuing to talk about this exile, but he's going to bring a slither of hope. He's going to give them a perspective into the future that he wants them to hold on to as they go through this 70-year period of exile. And this is where we get the context and the literary context before Jeremiah 29, 11 and directly after. So I want you to think of that verse you see everywhere, all over Hobby Lobby, all over Facebook. And this is what happens before and after directly. Jeremiah says this. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. There's our verse. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. He continues and says this. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Oh, that's a hopeful passage, isn't it? That is a slither of hope in 50 chapters of bad news. That's some good news, right? I, I think kind of what Jeremiah 29, 11 and its surrounding context is, is do you guys remember during COVID, especially the early days of COVID still in 2020, when every time we would refresh our phones and doom scroll and see the news headlines, they were always the most depressing things ever. It wasn't just that people were dying from COVID. It was there were things like murder hornets. And there were these scary things that were coming down the pike that we didn't know what was going to happen next. And so it was just all bad news on top of bad news. And then one fateful day, a few months into the pandemic, Jim Halpert from the office arrived. John Krasinski <laughs> arrived with this thing called SGN, Some Good News. It was an internet show that played four or five times where he just shared good news stories, things that were happening. Talked about medical heroes that were serving in our hospitals, how people were donating medical supplies for first responders. Talked about weddings and graduations. And it was just a slither of hope and good news in the midst of a lot of crap, right? And that is what this passage really is. It's some good news in the context of a lot of hard and bad news. So with that understanding, the literary and historical context around it, what, what do we know about what Jeremiah 29, 11, that memory verse is actually saying and what it's about and what it's not? Here's a couple of things. First, Jeremiah 29, 11 is about Israel's story. Jeremiah 29, 11 is not about me. It's not about America. It's not about you and your job search. It's not about you and your marriage. It's not about you and your bank account or the raise that you want. Jeremiah 29, 11 is first and foremost about the story of God's ancient people, Israel, and the plight that they were in and the story that God was leading them on. And that might be enough to tick you off and make you want to head to the doors, but that is what this verse is actually about. It's not about me. So I need to slow my roll a little bit, claiming a promise, right? Next, Jeremiah 29, 11 is about a future hope. It's not about a hope that you could reach out and grab. It's not about a hope that you could see tomorrow. <laughs> Jeremiah says that for 70 years, you're going to be in exile. And after that, here comes the hope. You know, the life expectancy during this time was 30 to 32 years old. <laughs> the people that were hearing this for the first time, this wasn't even something they would ever think that they would have. Maybe their grandkids would experience. But it was about a future reality, a future hope something that they could hope for for the next generation, hope for beyond what they would see as they were still breathing. Then the wider context teaches us this about this passage, that Jeremiah 25 through 29 is laced with pain and hardship. 
This whole context is not about mountaintop experiences like wedding ceremonies and open houses and graduation and uh, babies being born. The whole context is this is a hard, hard time. This is bad news with just a slither of good news in it. So perhaps we should think about it a little bit differently, the way that we use this. And this is important for me. This is, this is powerful for me for us to understand that it's laced with pain and hardship. Because I talk to people all the time who start coming to church because they think that it's going to be this pill that they can take, this shot that they can take once, and everything's going to be better. People come to church after a hard thing, and they think that this is the thing that's going to fix me. It's going to fix my circumstances around me. And again, what does that lead us to? A faith crisis. It leads us to thinking, well, sooner or later, like, <laughs> I rub the lamp, but there's no genie that comes out. Sooner or later, I'm putting my faith in good circumstances happening instead of a God that is there in the dark, even when I can't see him, and a bedrock of peace and hope, even when I can't grasp it. And I want us to understand this because I think for so long and for so many of us, we're in this kind of contract relationship with God and going to church or giving money to great causes because we think that this is the thing that's going to like rub the lamp so that the genie comes out and does things for me. And I hate to disappoint you, but I think it's the most loving thing to say is that that's not a promise that God gives us. And we use passages like this, man, we're missing the point. We lose the plot. So, spent a lot of time telling you, we're wrong. You're wrong. I'm wrong all the time. Jeremiah 29, 11 is not what you think it's about. It's mostly bad news with a little bit of hope, right? So, so how do we like, understand this verse today? How do we grab a principle from uh, this passage today in an appropriate way? How do we read Jeremiah 29, 11 and we grab something for our lives today in an appropriate way? way that's actually helpful to us, but ultimately it's true as well. And to do that, I told you we'd come back to it. We're getting linguistic. We're going to talk about words a little bit here. So let's look back on our verse of the day. And there's one word I want us to zero in on here. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And that word prosper, where we think about prosperity, where we think about everything up and to the right, we think about more money in our bank account, the corner office, we think about prospering in that way with comfort and there's no uh, pain at all. The word prosper in the Hebrew, it's interesting, it's actually this Hebrew word. It's shalom. It's the Hebrew word for peace. God says that I have plans to shalom you. And when we think about peace, we think about like a lack of conflict. We think about a no war or an inner tranquility that we have. But in the ancient Mideastern mind, shalom was so much more than a lack of a conflict or an inner feeling. Shalom was the language of God. Shalom was everything in its right place the world in harmony, you in harmony with others, you in rhythm and harmony with God. Shalom was the name of the game. And actually, you can follow this thread of shalom all the way throughout the scriptures to our future hope. Any bells going off? Any, any like on your dashboard things are connecting maybe? See, at the very beginning of the story that God gives us in this creation poem and story in Genesis 1, we see that in the beginning, there was this chaotic nothingness, and then God spoke order into the world. He took chaos, and he brought it into order, and what is used as shalom. The first people, Adam and Eve, they couldn't quite trust that this God loved them and was for them and that they could find their identity in him. And so they broke this shalom and order by listening to the serpent who told them uh, that, man, you should go take from that tree over there. Just go, go do that thing. And everything was broken in that moment for them between them and God and them and other people and all relationships and shalom was shattered in that moment. But God kept pursuing shalom for his people. We talked about Abram earlier, that God calls out of his land and says, hey, I want you to come and I want you to be a, make a nation and be a blessing and bring my love and my light and my peace to all of the nations. But the story of the Old Testament over and over and over again, and the story of our lives as well, let's not throw them under the bus, right, is that we forget who we really are and we don't trust that we are loved and we're called to be agents of that love and that shalom all over the world until 
a little bit before Jeremiah, there's a prophet by the name of Isaiah, and he's, he's speaking into this future reality that someone from the nation of Israel will hold. And he says this, and we usually read this around Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who was this who would bring shalom? It was Jesus who walked onto the planet, and everywhere he went, he saw chaos and disorder, and he would speak order and flourishing into broken people's lives, into broken systems, into broken realities. He was speaking shalom. <laughs> And this shalom went all the way to the cross and to Easter Sunday when death itself could not hold him down. And he sent his followers to be the next level of this shalom as partners in this shalom in the early church. Early Jesus followers would speak of Jesus uh, or Jesus would speak of himself when he lived about peace. He said this in John 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Uh, Jesus' early followers, when they're trying to make sense of what happened at the cross, would speak about shalom and peace. And we're told this in Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus' followers, as they're understanding this idea of this peace that God was bringing, this order and this wholeness he was bringing to the world, they saw the world was still a mess, but they kept pushing forward by telling everybody about this peace, but also exemplifying what shalom looks like lived out. But the world is still a mess, isn't it? The world is still a broken place. And there's a lot of disorder and a lot of chaos in our individual lives and in other larger systems. In the last words, in the book that God gives us, in the, in the book of Revelation, we usually think of Revelation as chaotic war and evil and all these weird images, but the ending of Revelation speaks about peace restored. Revelation chapter 21 and 22, starting in 21, says this, Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Genesis 1 there was a sea of chaos and chaotic nothingness, no more chaos at all. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. He continues, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. God is not done with restoring shalom and order and flourishing to his creation and to your lives. The very last part of the Bible, the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, says this. Again, no longer will there be any curse. You go back to Genesis chapters 1 through 3 and the curse that we think uh, happened and still happens. There's no longer any curse. The throne of God and the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. Oh, I love that. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. This is the thread of shalom, order being restored at the very end of the scriptures. Jeremiah 29, 11 says that I have good plans to prosper you, to shalom you. And we know through Jesus and through his work that there is ultimate shalom that is still on the horizon. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? The first implication I have for us is this. That for us, if we're going to take Jeremiah 29, 11 seriously, we've got to aim for perseverance, not prosperity. We've got to aim for perseverance to stick in the game, not just hoping for good things to come to us, but we've got to have our feet planted in the right direction to persevere whatever pains and struggles that we have going on. Because we understand that God is working a long redemptive plan that he will bring to completion, maybe not in our lifetime, maybe not in our children's lifetime, but God is still in the restoration business where he is going to restore the goodness of Eden in this world. And as we walk with him, he brings this foundation of peace and order to us that helps us get through the lows, through the exile seasons, through the hard seasons. How do we aim for perseverance, not prosperity, you guys? We understand that our ultimate hope is not in our personal glory and our personal success, our personal possessions. Our ultimate hope is this new thing that was started with Jesus 
that will come to fruition at the, at the restoration of all things that we see in Revelation 21 and 22. And the challenge for us, you guys, is that we don't like persevering anything in our culture. We want to push the eject button as soon as it gets uncomfortable. But I think the principle that Jeremiah is speaking to the ancient nation of Israel that we can grab for us today is that, man, we've got to stay in the game. Remember, his plans to prosper are way beyond what we can imagine and see with our eyes, but it's still the goodness of God that we can trust. But what's interesting to me, if we think about implications here, is that when you talk about perseverance, sometimes we can think about just like, I'll just sit there and take it, hands in your pockets, grit and bear it. I just don't have to do anything, just have to like persevere, the terrible things going around me, all that kind of stuff, right? feels very passive. But again, I think the literary context of Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29 11 speaks a truer, better word to us. Not just a grit and bear it, just like sort of hunker down and take it, but it's an active participation. I'll put it this way. We have the opportunity to partner with God in bringing shalom. We have an active part to play in the good plans that he has for us. Again, I want to go to Jeremiah 29. Verses 4 through 8, which is right before what we've read today. But this is what Jeremiah is saying to God's people who are getting ready to head into another exile. Bad news. They know it's going to be a hard time for many years. This is what Jeremiah says. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. He's not done. He continues, increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace, the shalom, and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for the peace and prosperity of the city, because if it, the city, (laughs) prospers, shaloms, you too will Shalom. This sounds a lot different than just, ah, this is going to be terrible. Oh, man, Eeyore. Oh, man, here we go. It's, it's so much more than that. This is an active partnership, participation. You know, it's an interesting thing when we go through hard times, or maybe it's just me, but <laughs> I can get so self-centered where everything is about my problem and the woe is me is thick in my life. That ever happened to you? An interesting principle about depression is that therapists and counselors will tell you, are you doing anything actively to serve other people? Are you doing anything actively to benefit other people? Or in your depressive state, are you just sort of in this loop of how bad everything is for you? They even say this in our modern psychology. Jeremiah says, hey, in this hard time, get your hands dirty in good work. Seek to the shalom of the people around you. Skin up your knees, build families and homes and communities and seek the goodness and the prosperity of this town that you're in exile in. I think inside of this, this is another principle for us to grab. During the hard times, we have to think beyond ourselves to the goodness and the flourishing of other people. And it's inside of that that we maybe find the good plans that God has for us. So I want to take us back here. This graphic here, where we have expectations of a life with God, then we have our actual lived experience. What do you do with the gap between your expectations and your lived experience with God? Do you just slow ghost into the bushes, Homer Simpson style? Thanks for the three people that got that joke. Do you just sort of go through the motions in an empty, cold, religious kind of way? Do you shut off parts of your heart because it's been hurt before? (laughs) It's where you're just like, I'll do this, but I'm not letting God into this area because that's too close. Does your belief and your trust in God maybe die in your head and your heart, but you're still going through the motions because of social reasons? Do you stop praying because the answers that you were seeking, you couldn't grasp them? What do you do? I think what we can learn from these principles today, my friends. Wherever you are, don't beat yourself up for it. Today is a new day, a new opportunity to walk in a different way. In the gap, 
What would happen if you, you committed yourself to persevere? You committed yourself to trust that God is still working in the world and God is still in the restoration business and I know where this is going and so I'm gonna trust the God who is gonna restore shalom. And you say, my feet are not gonna move. I'm still following him. Even when it feels like he's not working, I'm believing that he's still working. Persevere instead of just expecting prosperity. And then partner with God in shalom. In your gap, what if you determined yourself to still get your hands dirty or maybe go even more into serving other people, working for the peace, the shalom, and the prosperity, the shalom of other people more so because you, you know that you're called to this work and you're called to this action, this trust-filled waiting to where you're still going to work for the good in the world even when everything around you is chaos. What would happen if in your gap... You filled it with serving others and actively partnering with God to shalom. My friends, I, I don't know what kind of gap you have, and I don't know what kind of season that you're in. If it feels like an exile season, I don't have magic words to lift you out of it. And don't trust anybody on a stage at a church who tes- says that they do have magic words to lift you out of it. But I want you to know... I believe you're not alone in it. Some of the beauty of our faith tradition as Christians is that we believe that our God left the mountaintop place of heaven to come down into the pit, into our gap, to rescue and to be with us in the midst of it. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope and a future. That God is with you in it, and he doesn't change, even when our circumstances do. So with our gaps, let's trust him, the God who's with us in the middle of